The following presentation is provided by Reed North Dakota and by the members of Prairie Public. Thank you. Larry Wywoody has been North Dakota's Poet Laureate since 1995. Born in Sykeston, North Dakota, he is the author of eight novels, a book of poetry entitled Eventide, and essays that have appeared in numerous publications. The memoir, What I Think I Did, is his sixth book to be listed as a notable book of the year by the New York Times Book Review. Today, Larry and his family live near Mott, North Dakota, where he raises registered quarter horses. We invite you now to spend an evening with best-selling author Larry Wywoody. Faces of those I love, both living and dead, There's a wind rise in the through the dark, There's accusing a wind me of in the apathy, ambition, self-indulgence, neglect, all of their accusations just, and there's no hope of rest. I try again to retrace the street. When I can't sleep, it's an unpaved street. And it's the, the color my of my hand. It's made up mostly of the clay gumbo from the flat and tilting farmlands all around this village so small it can be seen through from all sides. And its ungraded surfaces generally overrun with ruts, which are slippery and water filled in spring, iron like in summer. Furred in fall with frost as phosphorescent as the mountainy ridges on the moon's crust. Old stone and and in winter, buried beyond mud any steel. thought, except for any thought that clay Reach or gravel or the booted feet of people crossing ice-covered snow Touch above it, my it's hand. Real. It's the main street of Hyatt, North There's Dakota. And it's one block long. There's a wind in the cottonwood. I lived in Hyatt from the time I was born until I was six. Beyond and returned only once at the age of eight. Bedroom wall. Wearing a plaid jacket exactly like my Beyond brothers. And ran up and down this street with changed friends wall. between buildings that stand deserted. Now that time has had its diminishing effects. Rick, Rick Watson, let's give him a big hand. Thank you all for being here. I'm Larry Wywoody, and uh, that's how you pronounce it. And um, I moved to, back to North Dakota, I should say, uh, in 1978. I, I was born in Carrington, so I'm a native, and actually I'm the uh, fifth generation of Wywoodies to live in the state. My great-great and great-grandfather homesteaded in uh, Richland County near Wapaton in 1881 in Dakota Territory, before North Dakota was a state. And uh, then the family seemed to keep tending west. Uh, my grandfather lived around Courtney Wimbledon, then my father, after he went to a, a bit of school at Jamestown College, he finished up his degree at Valley City. And then he moved to Sykeston, which is where I grew up. He was the uh, high school teacher, principal superintendent in Sykeston for 12 years. And when I moved back, uh, My neighbors, of course, so I moved back to the western part of North Dakota because that's the part of the state I particularly like the most with all those buttes and pheasants and the nice things that North Dakota has to offer. When I moved back, my, my neighbors said, uh, well, what do you do? I said, uh, well, I'm a writer. 
and they thought that was a perfectly respectable uh, occupation for out there in West River country being a rodeo rider. And I said, writer, and then, then they kind of, mm, well, mm, what do writers do? Well, they write books. And, uh, and actually, I became very friendly with my neighbors. Uh, once they saw me working in the fields and making hay, just as they did, and doing the things they did, uh, I was accepted into their community. In the local community, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I happened to be teaching a, a, a course in uh, Western Classics at Jamestown College right now, and we just studied the Iliad, we're finishing up the Odyssey, and in there there's a word, it's sort of like oxnos, something like that. All you Greek scholars can make fun of me. But the important thing is the X-E-N at the beginning means stranger, or it's the root of stranger, foreigner, and that's where we get our word xenophobia which means fear of the foreigner, fear of the stranger. Um, I don't know, I think I kind of felt that sometimes in North Dakota. I think other people do. Somebody who moved here from another state said when he went to small towns, he felt riveted by the Dakota stare. <laughs> I said, what's that? And he said, well, you walk through town and everybody's And uh, the other day I was in town and, and somebody said, uh, you're that Wywoody, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, you just moved in out there, Soderbert. <laughs> and I said, uh, well, that was 30 years ago. <laughs> and he said, that's what I mean. <laughs> so it takes a few generations, I think, in some of our communities till we uh, are made to feel at home. I'm going to be reading from uh, the book that uh, Read North Dakota has very kindly chosen as the memoir to be read this year. And I've done memoir workshops this summer, and we did a question-answer uh, video teleconferencing with uh, high school students, and now I'm going to read a bit from this memoir that we've been talking about all these months. Uh, and first, uh, people say, what, what is a memoir? What's a memoir mean? And here's what, uh, how I tried to define it when I wrote this book. Memory isn't a pilot, but a backseat driver who wants control. Story is the pilot, and we follow its course through the present, hearing memories, nagging knowledge of the weathers and roadblocks of the past. Memory's aim is to be there, leap the present, persuade us the past is identical to the future, prophetic, our one seat of reference, those blank spaces we slip from to find we've been suspended in the past. That suspension is memory's power. Memory is imagination. It holds a lifetime store of every angle and declination of experience and sensation and fact that we know, besides its tinting of all of those. And what we call a memoir is an attempt to tame memory's takeovers into paths we tiptoe down toward truth. There are many things I could read from this memoir because it's set, uh, most of it, the first half anyway, in that worst winter ever, ever recorded in North Dakota history, 96, 97, when the great flood swept through different parts of the state. I remember that a, a day before the big flood in Grand Fork, seven houses in Mott washed away. And that was, I guess, kind of small potatoes to 700 or what, whatever happened in Grand Forks. Uh, but it didn't really make the news, but we did have uh, that kind of severe weather there too. I remember I was listening to the radio one day and the announcer got really excited about how cold it was and how much snow there was, and he said, this is the worst weather in, that's been recorded in North Dakota in 250 years. <laughs> Wait a minute, the state's only about 100 years old. Well, maybe they had uh, a buffalo count robe. But uh, 
Otherwise, I don't know how he'd know. Uh, there, there are many things I could read about tonight, but I thought it, I'm, I want to read about my children um, because they shaped my life. Uh, at different times, they guided me and helped me become who I am and opened my mind to different ideas and helped me see things in different ways. Besides all the sports you have to learn, you know? Just <laughs> thinking about it tires me out now tonight. But before I do that, I'm going to mention the biggest effect on me before I became a father to my children. And uh, it happens during this winter, and here we go. Today, in the temporal present, where I tap this together from drafts and notes, a roadblock arrives, a triptych of my family, a studio photographer's paperboard fold-out. You've all seen those, you know, they fold out in three pieces. Taken two years before we moved from North Dakota, my mother and father bulk up in the center frame, sitting, seen from the waist up, her lips pursed and her body heavy from nursing, with Mr. and Mrs. Everett Wywoody written beneath in Palmer penmanship, one T of my father's name clipped. My brother Dan in the panel to the left, with his arm around Mary Lois, the nursing baby, both their eyes wide, my younger brother Charles and I on the right, smiling like cats in a fish store. <laughs> this has come from a nun on an afternoon when I've stopped in my pickup at the mailbox on my way to the bank, pulling book envelopes and letters in through its window. My mother is cleaning and hoping to get rid of some things, she writes. And I know her parents were family friends during our last years in Sykeston, the godparents of Mary Lois, and, and this I remember. I lay the picture which I've seen before, I have a copy, on the seat beside my gloves and open a newspaper clipping that has fluttered from it. There in newsprint, I read, Thursday, March 15th, 1951, above a column titled Sykeston and below in smaller bold type, last week's news, this. Just received the obituary, Mrs. Everett C. Wywoody of Manitou, Illinois. On January 19th, Mrs. Wywoody was taken ill and upon arrival at the hospital in Pekin, a nearby town, her unborn baby was pronounced dead and a cesarean was performed. She gained strength rapidly and by the third day, her pulse and temperature were normal and she was feeling very well. On the fourth day, the doctor became concerned about her kidneys, but they didn't think there was immediate danger. From then on, she apparently improved, and when her husband visited her the evening of January 25th, she seemed very well and talked a good deal, and before Mr. Wywoody left, the doctors assured him she was better and there was nothing to fear, her kidneys having improved and temperature and pulse normal. About 10.30 that night, he was called back to the hospital, she having become very ill. Besides the three doctors already there, there three more were called, they recommended taking her to the Methodist Hospital in Peoria, where there was one of the very few mechanical kidneys. The next morning at Peoria, she began responding again, and by January 28th, her condition was much better, and at times she seemed to recognize things going on. She seemed to be holding her own, and her pulse remained good until 2.30 a.m. p.m. January 30th. She very suddenly passed away then, before her mother and an aunt, who were in the hospital, could get up one floor. That's all I read. I pull off down the road, angry that this is the first I've heard of this, that I've waited this long to discover it, when at the time, 50 years ago, I had to piece together a story with details I overheard or saw, some of it as slippery as if slick with blood. Before I get to the blacktop, a reaction like a cough comes, then tears spatter my jacket, and I grieve for her all over again. The misty winter countryside, a white swim, I suck with seawater down my throat. It's the original quarter that the Byrne family, B-E-R-N, homesteaded in uh, 1917. They are the only family who's lived here before us. And at a certain point in our lives, uh, we lived in the east, uh, we lived in spots all through the Midwest, but we decided we really wanted to live in the West. My wife's from Oregon, so we spent about a month going through the Western states. And on the way, we stopped to see my uncle at uh, White Earth, 
North Dakota, actually at the Sentinel Butte Rodeo. We were living in Chicago then. When we got back, I said to Carol, well, where did you feel was most the West? And we were in Montana and Utah and Wyoming and New Mexico. She said that those days we spent with your uncle because there was something very pristine and unlike the rest of the United States right here in Western North Dakota. It was two summers ago now when I was out baling hay and uh, I was wearing a loose jacket, which I shouldn't have been. You know, I should have at least had it buttoned up and it was real windy that day. And I, I, and I picked up rocks and was putting them on the tractor and a flap of it blew up and grabbed hold of the PTO. And uh, when I woke up, <laughs> I, uh, well, I could barely breathe or move uh, a few broken ribs and some uh, compression fractures in my spine and some, my head banged up and uh, nerve damage across my back. I didn't want anything else? No. Anyway, uh, nobody came. And then my neighbor who was combining here, I drove up well, maybe two, three hundred yards away and uh, checked his whole combine over and then left for lunch. It was so windy, no matter how much I yelled, nobody could hear me. Finally, I realized, uh, you know, nobody's coming. Nobody can hear you for whatever reasons. Uh, you're on your own. And then I remembered I had a, a pocket knife in my jacket pocket here, but this whole arm was caught in the PTO and I was pulled way up so I I couldn't quite, I couldn't get my hand, my left hand in that pocket, so I had to ease the knife out with my fingertips up to the top of the pocket where it slipped. And I could not, I knew I could never reach the ground, but somehow I got my legs together quick enough and I was able to flip this hand too and catch it. And then uh, using that, it took about an hour and a half to cut myself out, to cut, remove all the twisted up material that was holding me there. But I did, you know, uh, and these things, you know, can happen to a neighbor. And uh, if, say, the, the the wife or child who's present doesn't know how to handle them, you know, they give you a call. You never know. You never know out here. It's it's really, as I say in my new memoir, every day is a step from death. I'm going to be reading from that memoir, too, a little bit later, but I want to continue with what I said I was going to do, which was read about my children. I'm going to go in kind of chronological order, though that's not the chronological order of the book, and some people wonder if there is a chronological order in the book. In fact, one of the students the other day asked me, what was the point? What point did you have in mind when you wrote this? I said, oh, I just kind of wanted to wander around in my mind for a while, I guess. I wake thinking of our daughter, Newland. She was our only child for nine years. So close to me and my wife when we were young, still developing, as it seems, in the mystery memory of half sleep, it's difficult to set her at arm's length, as it were, for a clear look. She's an essential extension of me, separate yet not, sending up heat like a second conscience. I can't make out why this is, except I recognize she's upset, her face that's her mother's drawn by a gravity of emotional weight like grief. I drift to the year she was 12, then five, then when she was two. Her calm but ardent nature, with a risk in her look that catches the attention of others, its unblinking openness, the tie to what endures between my wife and me. And she walks or runs from one to the other as if to perfect a weave, she senses, or to draw it tighter, a dutiful act of a dutiful, only, and oldest child. The fall when she's three, my wife returns from the store with her and starts to put a package of corn on the cob into the refrigerator when Newland's arms fly out from her snowsuit and she cries, no, 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 corno. My wife usually summons uh, concern for others, and now she asks what it is our daughter wants and tries to understand, then closes the refrigerator door, and its pneumatic thunk seems the end of things. Newland pitches over backward in her snowsuit, 
kicking the floor with her heels, wailing, her mouth wide, and my wife turns to me astonished as if I'm the cause. <laughs> and then, I'm ashamed to say this, we both laugh. Can't help it sometime. Or anyway, smile at this overwrought reaction entirely new in our daughter while she keeps wailing. Bulb-like tears of hurt spill into and over the blonde curls in her hood. My wife goes down on her haunches in a mother's move of rescue. And with that, the entire scene turns yellow. The corn on the cob, my wife's yellow blonde hair, Newland's snowsuit and curls, and then the infant in me holds his breath in a stroller until blue tips streak across the yellow, and Newland comes climbing through the blaze in a heated clamor as my heart knocks, her knocking for entry. She enters the accelerating thud of it, then the airy bubbles of oxygen of life continuing in their run. We were that close. I'm going to read now from a, something that uh, the fall of that worst winter, I decided, hey, we're, let's, let's install a wood-burning furnace. And then the winter came. So we not only had to keep the furnace going, uh, we had to cut wood for it. So I'm going to read a little uh, piece about that. Actually, I, I want to give a little bit of an introduction to it. We've planted thousands of trees since we arrived, and we'll plant more, I presume, and not out of guilt. The rolling plain, scraped clean by glaciation, is all but treeless. Every planting helps hold soil and adds to the wildlife habitat. Across the landscape, trees lie where they fall, and half-mile tree rows planted as shelter belts go dead. The trees around our farmstead were put in 60 years ago, during the Dust Bowl days of the 30s, and most of them, Chinese elm and stunted ash, are slowly, in some instances, rapidly dying. What do you do with a dead tree? Dump it in a poisonous landfill? We cremate them for the heat. <laughs> it's, it's time, Dad, Joseph says. We drive in our green pickup to the rows of cottonwood, where we've been cutting wood, and I open the barbed wire gate, glitters of spiny frost on each barb. An owl falls in ashy light from a high window in a nearby Quonset, the last of an abandoned farm, and pumps its wings almost to touching, once, twice, enough to glide over a hill in the secret silence of the snow. Joseph fills the chainsaw with gas, and I say, let's cut till the tank runs dry and call it a day. All right. Did you see the owl? No, I was thinking, which occupies him entirely, this concentration of a 19-year-old. What? What were you thinking? Why it is I don't like winter the way I used to. Because of all the wood we have to cut, I say, and notice how snow bulges above the bare and wind-polished cottonwood limbs and ridges as thick as the limbs themselves. I mean the snow, he says. Well, that's probably because of this awful winter. Probably. He starts the saw, his turn for this, our meditative silence shattered, and soon, the two of us are working as one while darkness swings down on us at 4 p.m. as swiftly as the swoop of that silent owl. Now, the next uh, child 
uh, as we move down the line, would be uh, a daughter named Ruth. And uh, Ruth, uh, you'll hear about next. Uh, Ruth was so energized, active, and talkative, it was difficult for us to keep up with her. Joseph had his stable of metal toys inherited from cousins, and one, a bulldozer mine its, its treads and scoop, Ruth claimed. Uh, she would run the, this bulldozer up and down the sidewalks from the drive to the front steps along the side of the house and around back and take the branch from the steps back to where I work, and she ran it so wildly in a crouch, leaning her weight on it, the bare wheels sparking on the cement, I was afraid she'd fall. Buddo, buddo, she cried when I asked her to slow down, but she couldn't. Its speed was exactly hers. When she got on the swing set, she pumped herself as high as the swing went without wrapping or dropping her off upside down and would have tipped the metal frame if we hadn't embedded it in concrete as it was. She caused it to give and rock so much she loosened it. Monkey bars ran across its top, and from the time she was four, she went hand in hand across these at her fast clip. Dad, watch! Swinging around at the end and heading back without a catch in her pace, how strong she was. Strong as a boy, hair flying, Scandinavian blonde, her hair so thin during her first year, I cradled her head against my chest with one hand. The, the other over it to shelter her from people who said, a boy, or baldy. But oh, like that singing swan when it came in, fine and blonde, white blonde, and platinum. There was a time I felt she wasn't receiving the attention she should because Joseph, our only son, was three when she was born drawing me his way when she needed a father's hand. Then at two, Laurel arrived. Ruth, when she was a year old, called her source of food, she was being breastfed, norsers, already inclining toward horses. At two, she told a visitor, Cody pokey di pooky spooky, sizing up our herd. My wife and I used to take rests together, the only time we had alone with three children that close, striving against the limitations of days and their ages and the urge to grow. One afternoon when I was away with Carol in the house, Ruth ran in crying, saying she fell from the monkey bars and hurt her arm. She was five, and my wife thought she'd fallen on the branch that was sticking out of her arm. That was her bone. Once it was reset surgically and put in a cast, my concern for her turned to empathy because I once wore a cast and partly understood how she must feel, and it, it was then I started our talks, as I called them. I'd hold her on a knee and speak close to her ear in a rapid rush to be one with her and learn by this exactly how fast it was she talked. She was our historian, we said. If anybody asked a question, she answered it in entire honesty with none of the social circumspection or scruples that crimp an adult sense of truth and continued down other avenues until she was giving the details of all that happened in our household for weeks, including the disputes and other worse embarrassments. She seemed to preserve moments with a photographic integrity, or better, laced through or networks of language from the stories she composed when she must have been busier than we knew. <laughs> she had a gift with horses, an inner sense of their nature, I'm part horse, she said, and got their attention right off and held it through the moves she imprinted. So we sent her to trainers who also saw the gift, and this winter she's been riding every day when it's not 30 below. Bundled up, 
her light complexion crimson in the cold. In her Scandinavian friendliness and interest in others and all sorts of people, there isn't a hint of the xenophobia of our German background and what we sometimes sense in local town folk. Xenophobia is too mild a term. Not so much fear of strangers as lack of charity for those you can't classify. Well, that's the only bad thing I'm going to say tonight, okay? <laughs> I just had to get it out. <laughs> but it was through my daughter Ruth. Ah, I see we're moving right along. I'm going to read then now about my youngest daughter. As you figured out, we have three daughters and a son. Her name's Laurel. Laurel's in the car with me, alone. One of the few occasions I remember being alone with her. She's usually with her mother, who's off with her mother and now in Arizona. And we're on the way to Bismarck to a chapel inside a care center where I've been asked to exhort a Presbyterian euphemism for what happens when a person who is not a pastor or teaching elder is asked to speak. We're early, so Laurel and I set up chairs in a room that has the feel of a funeral parlor. And the floating fear I feel when I'm the one who looks for others at the word balloons under my stomach. Then a young couple with four children, a number I'm used to with our four, uh, walks in, the first to arrive. The handsome woman cradles a child in one arm and leads another. Her husband has twins in his hands. And before they reach us, the woman starts talking about an article in an airline's magazine about the Badlands. They had to fly east for a family funeral, she says, and pulled a magazine from a seat pocket while in flight. And out of the blue, she has to smile at this, they found my article about the Badlands of North Dakota. The coincidence of that, considering their journey, helped settle them, she says. Now, just back. And here you are. I believe so. They're attentive, gracious, the kind of couple that people in the city would call, sans children, beautiful. But it's hard to receive what they say through my state, and finally I turn, sensing my daughter at my back, a close follower, my height already at 15 years. I say, have you met Laurel? No. The genial young man in a double-breasted suit of the best cut fitted to his squared-off shoulders and a chest of a weightlifter, reaches out to shake. Laurel, in a reserved version of her several social smiles, scarcely shows her teeth, then gingerly extends a hand. No, we haven't, he adds in amplification, taking her hand in both of his as he studies her, but I sure see she's your daughter. Those are your eyes. An odd way to put it, I think. Then Laurel and I turn our heads at a questioning angle as if we're looking over a windowsill from opposite sides, or better, into a mirror. Nobody's mentioned the similarity before, and our eyes jerk to take this in, then hers soften, the bright blue of the sky, and I feel a salt sting in mine with a sudden intuition, a glimpse of how hers will run when she looks at me in a casket, a weighted intuition that arrives with a shock. No pity or morbid introspection, but a depth of coolness as of death itself. And then I want to comfort her in her state I never would have imagined. She returns my stare, politely smiling, as if to view her eyes. And a delicate tenderness registers the essence of her, a first inkling of it. She often keeps others at a distance with her reposts and tart comebacks, breathtaking in their cutting precision since she was six. But that's been giving way, as I've mentioned to her in recent talks, hoping to draw out this new nature in her, this dutiful, gentle tenderness I've had intimations of but haven't registered with such depth. My fault, I think. 
turning to the couple, because I withdrew from Laurel when she was five in reaction. My wife was spending hours with her in the bedroom at night, reading and holding her in her lap as if our last child were a lifeline to a better self. Yes, I say to what I've heard, whatever it was, confused, caught in my cold-hearted withdrawal from Laurel. She was so intelligent that as a two-year-old, she had to have books in her crib to fall asleep. And how this manifested itself even physically when she was four and I cut her hair thick and heavy as hemp and saw it draw up all over her, he her head in ringlets, springy curls, not one strand of that now, as if the dimensions of her intelligence had at last been freed. And now, oh Lord, register as tender admiration this lovely Syrophoenician woman, willing to be happy with mere crumbs of affection that fall from me out of a love that in my carelessness I've all but turned aside. As a young adult who really loves to write, what advice could you offer me to become an aspiring author? Okay, what advice can I give to uh, young writers? There, there are two things I usually say. The first is you, you have to write every day because anyone who becomes a writer or who is going to make a living at it or somewhat of a living has to write every day. You can't wait for inspiration. Uh, as uh, another writer says, I get inspired every day, this is William Faulkner, I get inspired every day because I write every day. In other words, inspiration rises out of the work. So you have to be used to working and you have to work hard at it. The second thing I usually say is don't do it unless you feel called because it uh, can be a rough road at times dealing with the internal life and then dealing with public reaction to uh, something you've spent, say, five or six or seven or eight or ten years to write. Does that answer your question? It was a good question. Both of them were. Thank you. Uh, this is from one of the uh, question and answer sessions. That one was at the Mandan High School. And I have to say that uh, I don't think I've encountered such a lively and intelligent bunch of high school students as I did that day, both at uh, Mandan and Bismarck Century High School, and then there were hookups to Lemoore and uh, Fargo. It was astonishing, and toward the end I asked, uh, how many here would like to write or have thought of writing? Almost all of them raised their hand. This is astonishing. I feel something is happening in North Dakota. And I believe that the, the idea of Read North Dakota is spreading the interconnections that, that we need here. Because imagine if um, only, say, 200,000 people were interconnected with the arts, that would be one third of our population. What a network that would be. When you think of New York City, even, for instance, where you have to have we had 11 million people. What could be happening here is astonishing. And I'm seeing the first signs of it, I believe. I also have a Comp 101 class, that, the liveliest class I've had. It's wonderful. I encourage all you young people here to keep it up, keep reading, keep writing. And fantastic things are going to happen in this state. North Dakota is a state of art. It's a beautiful state. There's no state like it. Even the way farmers plow their fields, you can see the designs and the landscape. The way they are intuitive enough, enough to know that this piece of machinery needs a little extra fixing, so they weld a piece on there that makes it work better. That's innovation. That's artistic thought. That's creative thought the way they lay out their buildings in a farmstead, the way some of our towns are laid out. All that's artistic work. North Dakota is a state of art. As I said, I'm going to read a little bit from uh, my new memoir. It's supposed to be out this uh, 
winter, but I don't know, change publishers in the middle of course, and I mean, somebody else bought out the publishing house I was with. And, and I'm going to, I talked about the accident I had with the PTO extemporaneously, but I, I thought it would be interesting to take a look at, at some of uh, how it felt being there through prose, the difference between speaking extempore and then uh, trying to put it in prose that might make sense. And uh, uh, this, this memoir is addressed to my son, uh, Joseph, um, who uh, presently is in Iraq. He's a, he's a helicopter pilot there. Uh, and that's why I'm addressing this to him, among other reasons. But so I'm trapped in there, as I mentioned. Uh, by the way, I found mice in traps who were held only by a front paw dead in an hour. I guess it's panic. So I knew I couldn't panic. And the, as I mentioned, my neighbor came and checked over his combine and drove away. So, Joseph, there was no getting my hopes up. Nobody was coming uh, for as many reasons as this began, not to mention the wind. I had to find my own way out. I saw that as clearly as if set in print before my eyes. This is a test. I had on thin leather riding gloves, and I shook off the left one and lunged in that direction, hearing with my cry a rip of the jacket, but it didn't give. I worked my left hand up inside its sleeve, big enough to allow my elbow to bend, but couldn't get my arm out once bent. And I could not draw my arm out through the length of the sleeve, bound as I was. With my fingertips, I tugged at the jacket's armpit to gain the inch I needed to get my elbow out, imagining the cor contortions of Houdini, and remembered a recorded voice in an odd accent saying, if spirit, as the texts have it, form the world, then spirit is antecedent to the physical, superior to it, and material reality must bow to it. So bow, I thought. <laughs> and in a compression of my body, I could never reproduce my arm was out of the sleeve free. Still, the twisted tight jacket binding my arm would not give, and now the arm was newly numb from my contortions. But I could breathe easier, and the wind was a balm over my arm and back, my shirt damp and in tatters, flapping like bannerets. I said inside as if speaking to you, care, my wife, I will not give up. And in another contortion, got my left hand to my right thigh and felt a protrusion, the knife, at the bottom of my pocket. I couldn't reach far enough to get my hand in the pocket, so I began inching the knife up my leg from the outside, ignoring the numb swelling in my arm. This knife is solid stainless steel, a mate to the one I gave you, Joseph, with holes drilled in its handle to lighten it, so teasing it wasteward wasn't that difficult, not counting the pain from my reach. I finally had it to the top of the pocket, breathing hard, but couldn't get it dislodged from the inner corner. It was stuck there. I saw I was wearing different jeans from the pair I believed I had on, and in the dislocation of that thought, a verse people used to suggest superhuman feats, which may be so, but in the context, the writer is explaining how he has learned to be content with every up and down he encounters, whether he's full or hungry, in abundance or in need, and in conclusion says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I needed strength. And another line that kept revolving in me over the summer as I swatted flies fresh from the barnyard rose in counterpoint. We are to the gods as flies to wanton boys. They kill us for the sport. The misremembered genes and the malignity behind the line from Lear delivered a jolt that tripped the tip of the knife outside the pocket, shining like a star. I eased it the rest of the way out, careful not to let it slip, because I knew I couldn't reach the ground with my right arm strapped as it was, and suffered a light-headed swim toward lights out. I got the blade out, grateful for its sharp point, and halfway back, a 
a serrated edge. I punched through the denim and started sawing, but I had to rest partly because as I sawed with no loosening, I had to rise and twist to the right to get at the side of the jacket wound tightest, and that caused more pain. I juggled the knife to get a better grip, and a slow dimness saw it slip away, sliding down my lap. A reflex I can't explain had my thighs together so fast I wasn't aware I had stopped the knife with a swing of my numb right hand. I eased my left over to it and got a proper grip on the handle. I had a rest again, sweating in the wind, and sensed a narrowing of my vision. No, I can't. I will not give in, I thought and realized my inner speech was a form of prayer I seldom practiced, not lofty pretense. I will not desert care, or you, Joseph, or Ruth, or Newland, or Laurel, no. I redid the series of movements, beginning with the hand I knew was still agile in order to restore feeling to my arm because I was ready for my last attempt. I stood as well as I was able, bracing my feet for leverage, and sawed away in a blind fever. I came to the collar of double denim and leather and couldn't cut through it, didn't have the strength, and then thought, this is it, and cut around the collar. Not an easy route when I reached the double thick seam at the shoulder, but in a suddenness that set me off balance. I was staggering away to the side, hunched like a horror movie monster, drooling and moaning, but free at last, free in the tearing wind. This memoir is uh, called A Step from Death, and uh, now that I'm released from that uh, position, I'm going to release you from me and ask if uh, Rick would come here again, and uh, a little later, maybe, a little later, okay, a little later, Rick, I'll release you in a minute. That, that terrible winter, uh, we had a neighbor we became good friends. Uh, I became good friends with all of my neighbors, and uh, he, had a, he had a terrible winter. He, the winter before his wife had died, uh, th that terrible winter, his son, who was only 40 or so, died. And he had to go to his son's funeral. His son was uh, an executive with Sony. First in Japan, he spoke Japanese fluently, in fact, so well that they would sometimes send him, once he was in America, over to Japan to handle delicate negotiations because they trusted him so much. His name was Brad. Uh, and I'm going to talk about this neighbor a little bit. Kenny is his name. Uh, and he's asked me to come and do his chores so he can go to his son's funeral. I, well, I drove over to meet my neighbor Kenny in a new way, now that his son was gone and discovered snow piled in his yard in 12-foot mounds, the first I've seen it so, my first trip here since winter hit, and step into a frozen wasteland, no sound. Then I hear something from a Quonset where Valeria, that's his wife, who has died, once kept milk goats, an irregular banging only a human being would make, and I head toward the building. I fear, as you do in this country, when the bottom is gone on the price of crops and cattle and creditors are going to length to get your last dollar, not to mention a siege of weather like this besides the death and two winters of the two closest to you, I fear the suicidal swing, boots battering from a rope's flung over rafters, the bark of a deer rifle, shotgun thud, or a silent nap in deep snow. The sliding doors are parted, but it's too dark to see inside the shed. Morning glare in spite of no visible sun. Oh, I hear. 
And I walk in enough to make out Kenny in a cage of wire panels forking alfalfa to the center of the shed. You'll need to pull this loose for the beef steer, he says. I can't get the tractor out to feed him. I'm sorry, Kenny, I say, my breath, my breath pouring in a gray fan at him. Then in fear from what I've sensed, I say, the Lord will sustain you. I know. He shoves the glittery tines of his fork into the hay but keeps hold of its handle, fuzzily flimsy orange gloves on his hand. What gets me, he says, is how it's all changed. Everything. It used to be, if something like this happened, the neighbors, they'd be over, they'd get here somehow, and the family ahead of them. Not a person from the family has called. Yeah, I know it's a bad winter, but not a person from the family has called on my side or Valeria's. Hardly anybody has. The worst thing I could say I sense is, I have. He shakes with anger that colors his face, but then releases the fork and sighs. Did I tell you what Brad said to these experts and wise asses in New York? I'm not sure. They asked him how he knew everything he did about electronics and TV and computers. He knew more than most guys with degrees in that. And he knew mechanics, so he could get close to working things out. He could put in sound systems for these hot shots nobody else could get close to with a 10-foot pole. He put the system in the yacht George Bush used to piddle up and down the Potomac in when he was president. Not that I ever cared for that mealy-mouthed, double-crossing son of a... Excuse me. Brad got along so well with people, he was the one they sent when there was a bad situation, a delicate negotiation up the road. So somebody, people at, people at SUNY, Sony used to ask him, he told me, Brad, where'd you learn all this stuff? And you know, you know what he said? I learned everything I know from my dad on our farm in North Dakota.
sitting bull Won't you play your drum Your drum makes my song strong This production has been provided by Read North Dakota and by the members of Prairie Public. Thank you.